Okay, so today we'll discuss block ten, where we'll discuss the poems of Dylan Thomas, Philip Plath, and Sylvia Plath. So we have done with nine blocks. We have discussed till modern era, isn't it? Modern age. So today we are going to discuss postmodern age. So what do you know? Tell me what do you know about postmodern era? Any idea about the postmodern age? Modernism we discussed in the last class. Any idea? Okay, postmodernism is a movement hmm? started in the late twentieth century uh, as a reaction against modernism. Okay, so in modern during modernist era, uh, era or during modernism, mm -hmm. poets or the writers mm -hmm. they were trying to find some meaning. We know that the entire world is meaningless, mm -hmm. but the writers, the poet, they were deliberately looking for a meaning now postmodernism postmodernism hmm, is a reaction against modernism okay so the writers or the scholars of the postmodern era they are pretty aware of the fact that there is no meaning in this world the world is essentially chaotic we cannot uh, we cannot fix anything okay so postmodernism refers to a cultural intellectual or it only postmodernism is a reaction against reaction against modernism both are movements both are literary movements so uh, our T.S. Eliot hmm, etc Ezra Pond etc belong to modernism hmm, modern modern era see postmodern means postmodern era means age after 1915 after two world wars age after two world wars that is why it is said to be post after after modernism okay so ninth block forms belong to modern era modernism okay so the tenth block belong to modernism period postmodern period uh, i repeat during post uh, during modern era hmm, those writers even though they are aware that the uh, world is uh, meaningless they were trying to look for some uh, meaningful things in the world hmm? they were trying to put a unity in this chaotic world through their piece of art but but in postmodern era their attempt was entirely different hmm? the uh, attempts of the writers poets were entirely different uh, we have already discussed that see uh, from 20th century onwards hmm, our literature has become has attained a three dimensional quality actually writers um, writers have no specific role in it. Hmm? It is the readers who are active. Hmm? It is the readers who have to fill the space in the literary works. It is because it is they who interpret the work. Last class we have discussed that birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. Okay, the place where uh, an author dies. Hmm? begins the birth of the reader okay so postmodernism i uh, see it, it's a cultural movement or intellectual uh, movement which lacks a clear central hierarchy or a, it doesn't have any kind of organizing principle okay and it's full of hmm, contradiction ambiguity diversity etc and uh, see if you're reading you, you won't find any kind of uh, coherence of course it is an extension of mo uh, modernism but still unreliable narrators hmm? narrators will be unreliable Cons narrators will be shifting then they are not trying to attain any kind of unity let me tell you in, uh, last block we have discussed wasteland that is a collage poem isn't it we have uh, discussed so many uh, uh, scenarios from different centuries but in that poem T.S. Eliot was trying to attain a kind of organic uh, unity even though artists hmm, this is a scattered work he was trying to attain a unity but in this work in this particular uh, modernist work hmm, they are not trying to attain uh, any kind of unity because no. they know the world yeah, no. yeah. Uh, let me tell you they are not trying to attain any kind of unity because they know that world is essentially chaotic. That reflected in their works as well. Okay. So, 
let's see some of the characteristics of postmodern era so i told you period after sector two world wars hmm? so writers they mostly discuss taboo topics like sexuality drug alcohol alcohol uh, then domestic abuse then cultural identity then these writers mostly uh, wrote in free verse rather than see in previous see block one block two up to block seven uh, they wrote in heroic couplet and all hmm? they had some rigid rules and all but post uh, in the postmodern era from modern era onwards hmm, writers are not following any kind of rules okay they are writing in free verse now postmodern poetry already we have discussed there is a reaction against modern modest modernism still it is an extension still they maintain some kind of uh, what features characteristics in uh, mod, uh, postmodern period then irony so let me tell you uh, postmodernism employed it features through many literary devices like irony pastis absurdity hyper reality uh, etc okay so irony we know what is uh, what is irony intending some uh, intending something but saying and exactly opposite of that pastish what is pastish see nowadays we are uh, watching a lot of uh, spoof spoof and all see uh, reworking of something for example i think you are familiar with great indian novel isn't it the great indian novel where the author has approved previous character from mahabharata and he has placed in the present context where duryodhana has uh, see but indra gandhi has been given the image of duryodhana uh, but indra gandhi is um, uh, is projected as duryodhana okay duryodhana is the female version of indra gandhi okay fine so like that um, jinna is presented as karna like that see past is a kind of pasting previous existing elements in the modern work absurdity means that is no see sometimes when you read the more post modern work you will think see everything is chaotic no meaning nothing is connected full of absurdity because essentially the present world is full of absurdity now techno culture that you know because uh, in the modern work you may you will uh, come across the uh, weird sounds hmm? Pray, you will see the uh, phrases like um, or praying or, or onomatopoeias hmm? like that now yeah. so now loss of faith in politics and more uh, moral authority alienation from society i told you every man is an island every man in the postmodern era even though uh, see we are going uh, we are uh, we are enjoying life we are going to party etc every man is an island now black humor then uh, it is against commercialism hmm? uh, hedonism then mass production and economic globalized globalism so let me tell you uh, until 19th century hmm, most of the majority hmm, uh, of the i mean most of the nations were under the control british empire okay they were uh, forcefully taken as slaves but in the present era what happened they are willingly working for the capitalist countries the only difference is only difference between colonialism and globalization is uh, see imperialism was replaced by capitalism isn't this imperialism was replaced by capitalism previously uh, that position was occupied by british now it is occupied by capitalist countries like uh, us japan china germany etc etc so now we are willingly working for them now we are mechanical in nature okay we we have lost the spirituality that says for life hmm? hedonism what do you mean by hedonism hedonism means see uh, enjoying all the physical pleasures of life hmm? that is said to be hedonistic culture now now another feature of the postmodern uh, literary uh, work is that postwar poetry we were discussing the postmodern characteristics oh, okay, okay 
so if you are getting any uh, po uh, poems from this block 10 sometime they will ask you discuss the work as a postmodern poem if you are getting the po poems of philip larkin hmm? okay uh, discuss church going as a postmodern poetry so if you want to substantiate it as a postmodern poetry first of all you should know what is postmodernism okay so that is why we have discussed postmodern characteristics now post war poetry so essentially uh, as i have already said mm, we have with the witness to world wars mm, so many uh, countries yeah many uh, capitalist countries have uh, become very successful after mm, uh, two world wars but see writers belonging to i mean uh, writers belong to these countries mm, uh, through their poem they have uh, they never Uh, glorified the victories of their nation instead they talked about the horror bloodshed and the great death hmm? so mostly the poems were full of disillusionment okay so the post war poetry philip larkin dj and bright tom uh, gun etc some of the post war poets that is another cate category of post modern literary work now neo romanticism so let me tell you um, it is quite natural that every every literary age is quite opposite to that of the immediate predecessors their immediate predecessors see uh, romantics were um, against neo classicist isn't it then victorians were against romantics then a uh, modernist modernist writers were against their immediate predecessors victorian writers okay similarly every successors hmm? i mean uh, writers every writers were uh, against their immediate predecessors so modern i mean modernist writers and postmodernist writers they were largely pessimistic they were mostly discussing about this current social problems hmm? and dissolution in their life but uh, there is a hmm? class a group of poets hmm, known as neo class uh, neo romantic poets just like neo classicism hmm, uh, see they belong to the first half of the 20th century they revive the lost romantic elements okay they revive the uh, romantic elements so our dylan thomas belong to neo romantic uh, poets okay so i told you this is a neo romanticism is a reaction against realism and intellectualism or you can say that so i told you neo romantic poet they revived the romantic elements in the romantic elements of the late 19th century actually this was entirely a new trend in the 20th uh, 20th era because 20th era writers they mostly discussed the social hmm, psychosocial problems hmm? okay but these people are uh, see least bothered about uh, social or uh, hmm, psycho uh, social sector prob uh, problems in society they were mostly concerned about the hmm, nature uh, yeah nature and the individualistic uh, problems okay yeah are the characteristics of neo romantic poetry okay predominant element love then utopian landscape utopia i hope you know the term utopia ideal society isn't it so they were trying to bring uh, back that ideal society that they had not lost mm, the medieval uh, elements and all so they long for that romantic elements mm, then so back and forth narration just like see dylan thomas is one of the prominent neo romantic poets okay in his poetry you can see some uh, similar elements that of the william wordsworth Mm, we have discussed prelude william wordsworth prelude where he has discussed uh, uh, where he has projected nature as the teacher mm, mentor and friend similarly uh, in dylan thomas poem also you can see where he is projecting nature as his mother then yeah companion etc then nostalgic nostalgic element is common in his poems okay nostalgic element is not only common in dylan thomas poem but also in all neo classic neo romantic uh, 
poems okay and they were uh, en uh, entirely against the capitalism industrialization they were least bothered about the progress and scientific development in the society okay so the poems were full of hmm, rich with uh, sentiments hmm? and they com uh, they compared past era with that of the present era com they juxtaposed everything their ch childhood life uh, with that of the adulthood uh, uh, disturbed life with dylan thomas i hope you, you can see can you see the slide so there are three po uh, poets in this block dylan thomas philip clarky and sylvia plot okay so he is the only poet let me tell you almost all poets hmm, were against neo classical neo romantic tradition okay i'm sorry neo romantic tradition but he is the uh, one of the few a few poets who followed neo romantic tradition okay so now his earlier poems uh, he he uh, he died at the age of 39 is uh, he be uh, he became very famous through his uh, hmm, poem that he has written in his uh, early phase okay just like uh, unlike t s eliot he has in discussed any intellectual crisis or in uh, so social issues mostly uh, he discuss mostly uh, personal hmm, post personal issues childhood life hmm, in this a loss of innocence etc now let's see the uh, characteristics of dylan thomas poetry so you can see he has used lot of myth mythical allusions in his uh, poems hmm? Ar archetypes traditional religion then uh, rural rural and garden landscape surrealistic fantasy surrealistic means beyond realism okay beyond realism now next one see he i mean he imported exotic places in his uh, poems okay now perfect love youthful beauty innocence biblical allusion metaphoric language cosmic images so let me tell you these are actually uh, features of romantic poetry that is why uh, poems of dylan thomas are said to be neo romantic poems exotic elements Mm? Senti uh, sentimentalism medieval <clears throat> medieval elements yeah medieval elements knighthood love etc etc mm? personal uh, issues etc are neo uh, are romantic elements see modernists and postmodernist writers they never discuss any ideas any individual issues they are mostly bothered about the problems in the society that is how dylan thomas differ from other writers now common themes love and sex self discovery hmm? birth and death religion nostalgic past childhood human psychology and autobiographical elements now the first poem and death shall have no dominion is published in 1933 taken from saint paul's yeah title is taken from saint paul's epistle to romans so in this form see he treats uh, human uh, death as something uh, different hmm? he says that death is not the end of life but spirit see human spirit can conquer death okay so yeah the first stanza idolizes mankind and second stanza emphasizes on god uh and suffering and third stanza focuses nature and the very cosmic image so there are three stanzas in this poem now let's discuss uh major themes of the poem death is a th obviously death is a theme but he has treated death in a new way rather than treating death as uh fatalistic he says that human spirit can conquer everything that is not the end of any um, anything then perseverance so he is a poet who believed in a life after death okay so although see postmodern writers they don't have the tendency to believe in a life after death they are very practical 
So this person being a romantic, a new romantic poet, he believed in such kind of philosophy, that great cosmic philosophy that somewhat aligns with that of Einstein's. Hmm? And uh, yeah, what is that? Is equal to mc square. Matter cannot, uh, yeah, energy cannot be uh, destroyed. Uh, yeah, now be created like that. This person, every human being is a kind of energy, isn't it? After the after the death of the body, the soul joins the cosmic party. Okay, actually, we are becoming something great after our death. When we are alive, we are just a small, a, we are just a uh, minor entity. But once we die, we join the that bigger entity that is the cosmic. We become the part of and universe. Now, so he. In this poem, he glorifies death. Actually, it is something that bring, uh, brings goodness to the human being. All throughout our life, we are suffering, isn't it? We are losing our innocence. Hmm? We are troubled by the adulthood complicities. But after death, after death, we are getting an eternal life. Let's see. And death here solves all our problems in a positive way let's see oh my God. one second and that shall have no dominion and that shall have no dominion that men make it they shall be one with man in the wind and best moon when their bones are picked clean and clean bones go they shall have stars at elbow food and they do though they go mad and shall be saved though they sing though uh, uh, through the sea they shall rise again Though lovers be lost, or love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. So people mm, are afraid of death, isn't it? They, we are afraid of death. But in this poem, poet says that actually death has no domination in the present world. Death has lost its what value mm, or relevance. Why? Because see, we people mm, have suffered. We are suffering a lot mm, when we are alive. Once we die, we become naked because now when we are alive, we are, we have the, we wear the attire of jealousy, isn't it? We wear, the, uh, of course, see, soul is the actual body, our flesh and bone, except, etc. are our clothes, isn't it? So we wear the cloth of jealousy, mm, hatred, etc., etc. and all. See, once we die, all these things get dissolved, isn't it? So men be, uh, become what naked, okay, and they will be cladded in, just like Wordsworth said, they will be cladded in white. Mm? They will have stars uh, at their foot. Mm? They will turn into something. Haven't you <laughs> uh, seen in movies and in cartoons uh, where they say that after the death, human beings will become stars in the sky. Similarly, once we die. We will become, we join the greater cosmic uh, party. Okay, so those people when uh, they were uh, who were mad when they were alive will become sane again. They will become normal people once they die. Mm? And those people who suffered in the mm, sea of sorrow, those people who suffered in the sea of sorrow, they will rise again. And those lovers, mm, uh, who became un unsuccessful hmm, when they were uh, alive. Hmm? See, even though they are dead, their love will remain forever. Just like J Romeo, uh, Romeo, Juliet, Laila, Mashnu, their love will live long forever. And they will be reunited in the heaven. So death shall have no dominion. So in this poem, poet presents that death has lost its relevance. Okay, because he is the he's a poet who believes in a life after death. Okay, our soul or yeah, our soul joins that greater cosmic entity. So yeah, in the second stanza he says that see he discusses about those sailors hmm, who um, uh, who got perished in the sea. See. Uh, after their death, they become the hmm, obviously their bonds, hmm, etc., turns into hmm, in poetical imagination, they turns into uh, gems or jewels like that. Thus, they 
become more precious isn't it they become more precious after death and see those sailors who got perished in the sea they are very courageous hmm? actually all their sorrows have come to an end uh, after death all their sorrows have come to an end now and uh, in the second stanza if you have the textbook you can see that there is a unicorn metaphor unicorn is nothing unicorn unicorn okay there is a unicorn metaphor where poet compares unicorn with that of jesus christ actually unicorn we, we know that it's a mythic uh, unicorn is a mythical animal hmm? with a single horn and uh, unicorn's horn has got a, a <clears throat> speciality that it can neutralize uh, poison it can neutralize poison okay so here unicorn is pres uh, is, uh, is presented as jesus christ something that can neutralize evil hmm? physical and mental uh, i mean problems it can cure both now so now the third stanza uh, poet says that see all those uh, people are long dead they are no more worried about the hmm, material materialistic world or physical elements they cannot they cannot hear the sounds of sea birds or hmm? yeah gulls they are happy they will be resurrected they will be resurrected just like daisies Hmm? they are pure now you hmm? see all those people who who were impure or selfish malicious vicious when they were alive once they die they will become pure or like daisies please okay that is why it is said that when human being die they become uh, naked and they were cladded in white they were cladded in white isn't it they were donned in white why their soul is now pure so death is something see unlike mourning death uh, see when while other poets were most of the postmodern and modernist writers were mourning death they were lamenting about the death of people because this person is celebrating death say like it is something good actually it has freed human beings from a prison hmm, where we are raging for something power hmm, money uh, sex everything now we are freed from such kind of things now we are partying with the universe so that's all about that shall have no dominion the next poem is poem in october so poem in october is derived from the volume death and entrance where he presents his childhood hmm, in contrast to uh, monotonous adulthood life okay so i already told you Uh, these are the features of neo classic i'm uh, sorry neo romantic poetry okay so this poem was written in 1944 on the occasion of his 30 uh, 30th birthday see this poet has written so many poems on his 10th birthday 20th birthday 21st birthday 25th birthday like that this poem was written on his 30th birthday now so there are seven stanzas made up of 10 lines each hmm? so here in this poem he presents a contrasting uh, see he compares and contrasts urban life with that of the village life okay so he was born and brought up in swansea in london swansea is a place in london later he moved to usa okay so see he he was not that happy uh, about that uh, what transformation but his life the circumstance has forced him to move from uh, london to usa so his life uh, has become his life in usa is now very materialistic what do you call mechanical in nature he has lost that zest for life once he was in swansea he had that hmm, zest for life now he lost everything now his life is full yeah. of monotonous elements okay so he come uh, he compares his uh, sit Uh, i mean present city life which was uh, full uh, i mean which is full of frustration barrenness hmm, with that of the peaceful village life so yeah we have already discussed that it is a uh, hmm, com uh, compared uh, yeah he compares and contrasts urban life with that of the hmm, village life now the poem can be read along with fern hill okay that is also prescribed in your syllabus 
Cornhill. Corn Cornhill is also a poem about childhood days. <clears throat> similar kind of poems, okay, similar themes. Most of his poems uh, have similar themes. Now, major themes of this poem, of course, nature. Yeah. Uh, see, just like our words work, he talks to non, I mean, non-living things. He can talk to non-living things just like uh, words that speak, uh, speaks to nature, trees, water, river, mm, boards, etc., mm, etc. Et Our Dylan Thomas mm, is also speaking to birds, uh, I mean, sea, hills, mountains, clouds, etc. Okay. So these are his companions. Actually, he is more comfortable with non-living things and nature rather than mingling with human beings okay so nature is a major theme in this poem now nostalgia for the past he says that his childhood life hmm, was very uh, uh pleasant okay so i would like was very pleasant but now he is in a different place hmm? 30th birthday he is not able to celebrate like that uh he, like he had celebrated while he was hmm, 10 hmm, when, when he was 10 years old so he is longing for that uh, um, heydays and he is revisiting his fancy hmm? he is revisiting his uh, village fancy and he is comparing the weather of the fancy with that of the country life now let's see poem in october it was my 20th year to heaven <laughs> See, it's very interesting. He, so he compares every birthday or each birthday as a as steps in ladder to heaven, isn't it? Every year we are getting closer to heaven, isn't it? We are climbing that step to heaven. So he says that it was my thirtieth year to heaven. Yeah, walk to walk hearing. Uh, yeah, walk to my hearing from harbor and neighborhood. And Masir Poot and Heron priesthood showed the morning beckon with water praying and call of the seagull and group and knock the sailing boats on the net web wall. Myself to set food, the second in the still sleeping town and set food. So that was that uh, the it was his 30th birthday. Hmm? Uh, he, uh, he woke up hearing the sounds from the harbor and nearby woods. Hmm? So anyway, his sleepy mood is hmm, disturbed by the sound of seagulls and brook. So when he woke up, uh, see, he describes the tides of the sea, hmm, the water in the sea are praying. Hmm? They are praying. Okay. So let me tell you, uh, he has decided to take a walk to his uh, village, that is Swan Sea. So he set his food uh, food. Now, the second stanza, uh, see, he reached, um, when he when he woke up his uh, other residents of the uh, his uh, country, hmm, they were sleeping. Okay, so he continued his journey and in second stanza, we can see that he reached his uh, Swansea and the very meaning of his name, Dylan, means sea tide. So, he's describing his uh, village okay so the uh, village house he has got a farmhouse the farmhouse belong to oh, his farm hmm? and farms and houses are very common in that village okay now uh, he can see uh, birds and trees uh, branches of the trees are hmm? swaying so uh, when the wind blows the branches of the trees are swaying so he says that uh, all those trees uh, have wings hmm? So his winged dreams, we can say that Dylan Thomas is very, what, very creative and imaginative poet. Hmm? So he says that trees are having, the branches of trees are, are having wings. Okay, now, yes. now, so he describes every single thing in his village. See, one thing you have to know, he is not describing any, uh, uh, human beings is describing the nature. Okay. So, anyway, time has come. He has to move on. Hmm? So, uh, he is 
leaving that premises of Swansea. Now we uh, we can see that uh, in the third stanza, hmm, he's climbing hmm, a mountain and uh, he reached the summit of that mountain. Now he uh, looks at his village hmm, and he says that, see, everything appears to be very small and it is a very beautiful sight hmm, to uh, look from a top of a hill. Thereafter, he says, he compares the wind, whether at the both side of that hill he compares the weather in the countryside with that of the weather in the uh, town let me say tell you something throughout the poem we can see that weather weather climate is not good climate is not good that is the reason why he shifted uh, he was forced to move from swansea to town okay and one more thing Actually, he really want to be there in the Swansea, hmm? but climate or the weather hmm, didn't allow him to stay there. It is not the climate. Uh, you shouldn't take the uh, literal meaning of the climate, but weather or climate means circumstance, living condition, other circumstance. It is due to his circumstance he was forced to leave that place. So he was very sad about that. Now, yeah. Now he discusses the weather hmm, about the woods. Hmm. See, uh, near to his town, there is a forest. He compares that forest to that as a neighbor. Hmm. The, near to his uh, home, uh, yeah, near to his home, there is a wood, there is a forest. I, uh, I told you, he compares that wood to a neighbor. Okay. Uh, so he's discussing about apples, new colorful fruits, apple pears, red currants, uh, and blue sky. About everything is hmm, brilliantly colored. Hmm? So and he compares the uh, these brilliantly colored things with that of the scene that he had while he was young. Okay, but towards the end of the poem, we can see that hmm, he realizes. All these beautiful things have been lost. Hmm? Now he has become very, uh, what? He has become uh, not too old, but he has reached an uh, age or reached the position where he cannot take delight in these type of things. But uh, every birthday, hmm? on, on his birthday, though, uh, he goes back to all those ancient, I mean, old stuff like sea, farmhouse, hmm, hoses, etc. Now, oh. yes. So as I have told, there are many symbols in this poem. That is heron, gull, sea, forest, hills, mountain, clouds, farmhouse, etc. But throughout the poem, we can see that he hasn't mentioned about any uh, human beings. He's mostly concerned about the nature. Okay, fine. Now the next poem is Fern Hill. Fern Hill, I told you, uh, this is an autobiographical, uh, semi-autobiographical poem, okay? Where author is eulogizing about his childhood days. Then uh, that Fern Hill belongs to his aunt. Hmm? The first, the poem has got two parts. The first part, he's, uh, he celebrates his childhood days. In the second part, he, uh, he remembers hmm? or he realizes that oh, he is no more uh, in that state or he is not in, a, uh, in the Garden of Eden. He has lost all those uh, luxuries or amenities or those uh, status as a prince. While he was young, he, he had a status of a prince. He was not bothered about any uh, problems in life. But when he uh, grown up, now he is pestered hmm, with a lot of issues. Hmm? Society is very much corrupted, has got so many family and, uh, and other uh, problems. Okay. So he's comparing the childhood life with that of adulthood life. In his previous poem, he compares village life with that of town's life. 
see fern hill and uh, poem in october more or less same type of poem okay alike poems are alike so you can read fern hill with that of poems in october companion poems fern hill is an autobiographical poem in which see he uses memories of childhood days in journey from innocence to experience just like a uh, prelude words was prelude hmm? yeah then another myth of the fall of the man yeah but biblical element the fall of adam and eve from the garden hmm? the garden of eden then world of experience hmm? miserable manhood same theme as that of prelude okay same theme as that of prelude now now as i was young and easy under the apple boughs and lit, uh, yeah house and happy has gra uh, grass was green the night about the dingle starry time let me hail and climb golden in the hay days of ice and honored among wagons and yeah i was prince of the apple towns and once below a time i lordly had the trees and leaves Pray with daisies and barley down the rivers of wind for light. So, in this poem, he says that hmm, when I was young, he had a carefree life under apple trees. Hmm? And see, and about the link house and happy. See, when he was a little boy, he used to make small. Uh, we all used to uh, make small, small house, right? So his life was green as grass. Hmm? Green as grass means fresh as grass. Okay. So the night above was dingle starry. Okay. So he, uh, see, see, he is referring to that life that he spent in his aunt's farmhouse, Fawn Hill. Okay. So that was a beautiful night. See, starry night. He was discussing about the night he had spent in his aunt's farmhouse, that starry night. Uh, carefree days, hmm? golden in the hay days of uh, hay days of his eyes. Those day, days were really golden. Honored among the uh, way, uh, wagons. See this man. <laughs> See it's a farmhouse, right? So they will be ha having a lot of cars, wagons to uh, fill the fruits hmm? and all. So this person used that <laughs> cart and wagon as his chariot, and he was the prince among the apple towns. So, who are his subjects? Do you know? Just like I think you people are familiar with this uh, story, Wizard of the Oz. Wizard of the Oz. Similarly, his subjects, he was the prince, and his subjects were trees, apple, fox, birds, etc., were his subjects. Okay. And he was the prince among the apple towns. Once below a time, I not only had the trees and leaves, hmm, trailed with daisies and barley. So he, uh, see, was so happy to uh, spend his days in uh, that fern hill hmm? among daisies and barleys down the rivers of Windfall Light. And he was, uh, bay, uh, he was barked with celestial light. Yeah. So we have already discussed that his uh, childhood days were um, golden days. Hmm? His subjects were birds foxes cow goats and other animals see once again i'm stressing you he hasn't mentioned about any human beings just like poems uh, in october in this corn hill also he hasn't mentioned anything about human beings so uh, in the apple town he was he was the prince he was the huntsman herdsman he played all roles okay so and he says that in stanza number three says that some can be young only once what does it mean? That means childhood, <clears throat> childhood days hmm? that will not last forever, isn't it? One can be young only once. Not sun is permanent. Obviously, sun sets and it rises the next day, isn't it? But human beings can be young only once. Unlike sun, it can uh, we, we can be young only once. So, yeah. Uh, you cannot enjoy the glory that even though he was bathed in celestial light in, while he was in Fawn Hill, he uh, we cannot or he cannot enjoy that glory forever. So, yeah. 
Now, he again discusses, in fourth stanza, he again discusses about his childhood fantasies. Now, he fantasied that uh, in his dream, he dreamt that uh, his farm has, has been carried away by owls. Next day, when he woke up, he saw uh, his farmhouse back with uh, roosters on his shoulder. So here he presents farmhouse as a person. He personified the farmhouse. He personified Fern Hill. Is it possible uh, to carry away the farmhouse? Okay, we can carry away the animals and other harvest and all, but it is not. It is impossible to carry away the farmhouse. So he poet while he was a boy. Hmm, he fantasy that this uh, somewhat someone has carried away owls have. Owls have carried away the farmhouse. Next day, when he woke up, he has seen uh, his farmhouse has re uh, returned with roosters on his shoulder carrying dew. Okay, so why why he uh, he's having such kind of fantasies? Because he he's a boy hmm? that shows the innocence. So he enjoyed all pleasures of that farmhouse just like adam and eve before that before they committed the original sin okay now in which stanza he says that now he uh, realizes that hmm? see poet has grown up now he is having a lot of problems hmm? uh, he, that glorious days ha have gone hmm? no see now there are no children in that farmhouse okay so now his carefree days have gone so uh, see anyway he uh, he accepts see the end of childhood he compares with that of death the very birth of manhood he equates it with that of death so it is uh, uh, it's inevitable hmm? Death is inevitable, or that a phase of adulthood is inevitable. Unavoidable phase. We have to go through it, isn't it? So he in this poem he's eulogizing the childhood days. Remember. So if you're getting an essay question, you can just juxtapose a poem in October with that of Fern Hill. I told you poem in October, poet compares village life with that of town life. In Fern Hill, he compares childhood life with that of monotonous adulthood life full of problems. Okay, very simple poem. Now, simples in Fern Hill. See, uh, in poem in October, there are a lot of simples like herons, seagulls, rooks, mountain, Harbor, woods, hmm, clouds, etc. Similarly, there are a lot of symbols. Actually, this poem is full of symbols. Okay, so here he says that he uh, prince. He says that he is he was a prince. Hmm, why? See, when you are a king, he he he, uh, he never says that he was a king. Why? When you are a king, you will be having responsibilities. Even though you are having a royal status, you 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 have a lot of responsibilities. If you are a prince of of course, you can enjoy the royal status. You can, uh, you are carefree. Yeah, you're totally uh, carefree about all those uh, kind of problems in the country, isn't it? That is why he equates his position with that of prince. Mm? And green color, that shows happiness and, yeah, the, I mean, the fresh face, white. He was, the, his days were lamb white days. He says that uh, the days in Fern Hill, were lamb white days. That means he was as pure as a lamb. Okay, again, golden color, golden days, fire, time, prince. These are some of the elements. Now, happy as the grass is green. He was as happy as green grass. That means that shows the freshness and <clears throat> what? A longevity. Okay, now, alive and healthy. Why? Purity and innocence. Innocent shepherd. See, uh, in this point, he mentioned that he had played herdsman, herdsman, huntsman, king, etc. So shepherd means shepherds. Okay, Jesus Christ is a shepherd, right? 
Jesus Christ is a great shepherd. So he equates with that of Jesus Christ. Why? He was as innocent as shepherd or Jesus Christ. Now, so these are the major elements in the or symbols in the font hill. Now, next poem is a refusal to mourn the death by fire of a child in London. Now, this poem was published in 1945 after the end of two world wars. So let me tell you, in your notebook, in your textbook, um, <clears throat> maybe they have referred about the death of a child. But let me tell you, it is not the death of a child. They are speaking child here or the refuge. Um, yeah, the child here represents hmm, those people who had lost their life in two world wars. A refusal to mourn the death. Actually, here, poet doesn't want to lament the death of the child. Hmm? Okay, this poem is about mourning. Hmm? Yeah, whether to cry or not. Poet doesn't know whether he should cry or not. Hmm? A child has uh, hmm? uh, burned to death hmm? in London. So, who, who is London's daughter? The child is represented as London's daughter. Hmm? So, the question is, is this a single person or does she represent a group of people? Actually, she represents a group of people. Okay. So, here poet is not ready to mourn a singular death. Because, see, uh, he is a, he belongs to first half of the 20th century, right? So he has witnessed First World War and Second World War and other Civil War, Boers War, etc. So many <coughs> uh, issues like that, isn't it? Wars and other bloodshed uh, atrocities like that. So now he has become what he called numb. He, he doesn't know whether to cry or not. Hmm? Or see, mourning has lost relevance in the present world. Because this is not a uh, this this is not going to end today or tomorrow. This is an endless process. Nation will call for war. Hmm? People will fight against one another, and they will die. So, what is the relevance of crying for a person or a group of people? Okay, this point demonstrates inability to fully register the death of another, even though we want to cry. See, uh, people are losing their dear ones. They wanted to cry. But our poet has lost that ability to mourn for the death hmm? or the dead person. Okay. It shows toism, numbness. Toism means numbness, insensitivity, insensitivity. Okay. So poem is divided into four stanza of six lines each. Now let's see the major themes of this poem. Death and destruction. So, occasion of this elegy, I told you this is a lamentation, uh, a poem that mourned the death of a child or a group of people. Okay. Uh, mm, so, a child has mm, uh, been killed in, in an air raid in London during Second World War. That is the occasion of the poem. Okay. So, see, he says that if he mourns the death of the child, then it will be defaming the child, the glory of the death. Actually, just like in the previous poem, death is actually the, uh, providing a solace mm, or a uh, end to all kind of all sort of problems on earth. So, in then the next theme is loss of innocence and youth. So, death of child, death of child. See, refusal. To mourn the death, death of child, as in Fawn Hill, can be seen as loss of innocence. See, in Fawn Hill, he presents that childhood days have gone, those hay days have gone, golden days have gone. He equates those, he equates the very end of the childhood with that of death. Man or human being is literally dead. Because no more he is able to enjoy the extraordinary elements or those kind of beautiful things in the world. Human beings are very much pestered 
with the social problems or day to day issues in life isn't it so they lost the innocence so death of the child can be also seen as loss of innocence hmm? in the heart of people in the modern world then futility of the art so he says that he lost the ability to lament the death that shows futility there is no point in crying for anything okay it's not going to end it will continue we human beings are totally hopeless and helpless in the present scenario now transformation yeah that is the common theme just like in death uh, shall have no dominion hmm he once again uh, presents that actually see the poet shall never mourn the uh, glorious death of the child why it is said that glorious death that is actually something great uh, it is uh, has he mentioned in uh, death shall have no dominion you are becoming a part of a uh, something bigger isn't it you are joining water you are joining cloud you are joining nature so why should he mourn i mean man will die only once see he is already dead he is already dead once he passes uh, his childhood phase he is already dead then why he why, why should he cry actually after death through death one is getting reunited with that timeless uh, i mean unity of nature it so has we discussed uh, the first section he was crying uh, he, uh, he was lamenting uh, sorry he says that there is no point in lamenting the uh, death of the child hmm? and in second stanza he will on, uh, he will only understand that feeling whether he should cry or not only when he when he dies hmm? until unless he enters zion zion is again see uh, kingdom of heaven he will not uh, he will not understand that feeling uh, the feeling of uh, being dead he will not understand it until unless he enters zion so uh, he says that shedding see uh, you, you might you know, see if you have textbook you might have uh, come across the word salt seeds he doesn't uh, it doesn't want to so salt seeds there is no point in shedding salt water it cannot bring those dead people back so what is the very point of crying okay and even if he sheds uh yeah even if he uh, shed tears hmm what see the ground will remain barren nothing is going to uh, germinate or grow the girl or the i mean the uh, child that is uh, the child that is dead or the people who have been killed in the first world war and second world war they will not come back to life so there is no point in lamenting now again in the last four stanza he says uh, he glorifies as i said hmm, he glorifies death now uh then uh, see i told you uh see childhood phase he equates with that of adam and eve so if the child has died young the child has died and young then she or he should be considered as very lucky or fortunate enough that because he has joined or the particular person has joined the forefathers our uh, forefathers they are now not pestered uh, with the difficulties or problems of life Thames is on the river. Thames is at morning. See, if someone dies, nothing is going to stop. World will go as usual, isn't it? Uh, let it be the president of America or India, or let it be the head uh, head of world nations. Hmm? Nothing is going to stop, or nothing is nothing is going to change. Everything will uh, will con continues as usual. Okay, everything uh, will continue as usual. Fine. so that is the main gist of the poem what a refusal to mourn the death of a child in london now he has used so many religious and biblical elements like zion hmm uh, synagogue etc boomsday 
he says that morning the death will be blasphemy it will be like a uh, questioning or talk, acting against god because death is god's will and so why should we lament death actually actually it is uh, putting an end to all kind of problems on earth so we should celebrate death okay next poem uh, so next poem that is included in the block 10 is philip larkin hmm? philip larkin is a movement poet remember dylan thomas is a neo neo romantic poet sorry neo romantic poet uh, philip larkin belongs to movement poet movement okay movement is a movement okay movement now larkin is a pessimistic poet let me tell you he is a pessimistic poet he was deeply influenced by the <clears throat> uh, novels and poetry of thomas hardy a victorian even though uh, he lived both in uh last half of the 19th century and the first half of the uh, 20th century he was largely classified as a victorian poet thomas hardy so philip larkin was influenced by thomas hardy hmm? now this person has become famous through his uh, poems like church going bits and wedding etc and philip larkin by profession uh, he was a librarian and uh, he died in eight, eight, 1985 and he was unmarried yeah. so i told you he belonged to the group of poets called movement poets movement poets okay anyway the term was coined by j d scott in 1954 hmm? a group of poets who belong to this circle were kingsley amis donald davy dj and bright john wayne elizabeth jenning farm gun robert conquest etc <clears throat> so these poets were against that bourgeois class bourgeois class means mediocre class so let me tell you uh, see society can be divided okay can be stratified upper class lower class bourgeois class upper middle class So let me tell you, all writers were against this bourgeois class, middle class, because according to writers, they were the most vicious, cunning, manipulative class. Pick it. I mean, bourgeois class. So these group of poets were against the uh, hypocrisy, hmm? uh, cunningness, or uh, rituals. Some kind of this. I mean, those people who are trying to bring any kind of orders or. Uh, Hmm? such kind of rules and regulations in society because they know that world is not like that world is going to be very chaotic or even worse than that hmm? it is ex- <clears throat> it's, it is absurd meaningless hmm? hope world is full of hopelessness despair nothing new so what is the very point in uh, bringing some kind of uh, systems rules regulations etc so they were against such things industri- uh, industrialization hmm? such kind of capitalist uh, policies and all so movement poets were against capitalist policies okay uh, they mostly wrote about working class people working class people i think you people have done with mg2 right british drama hello are you people there mm. yeah so you people might have done uh, gone through mg2 where you have um, discussed uh, one of the walking tours what is the uh, title of that drama that you have book. done in mg2 mg2 look back in anger ma'am kitchen sink yeah. drama yeah look yeah kitchen sink drama look back in anger it mostly discusses about the pro- proletarian class working working class group isn't it proletarian so these writers mostly concentrated uh, about the uh, issues of the proletarian class or working class john osborns look back in anger isn't it yeah fine <clears throat> see let me tell you uh, philip larkin were and uh, philip larkin and other movement poets were against neo romantic poets okay neo romantic they know that there is no romantic elements in the uh, present context isn't it everything is gray and dull everything is bleak yeah 
so essentially the movement was a reaction against extreme romanticism and surrealist detachment of the neo apocalyptic like dialogue talks now yeah so on the other hand these movement poets they reconstructed neo classicism hmm? a general treatment of direct moment uh, Uh, direct comment involvement in politics and social doctrine yeah these uh, people are mostly interested in discussing hmm, social or hmm, uh, psychological issues now see by 1950 1960 uh, england hmm, uh, as defend isn't it england has lost its power in the uh, world isn't it um, uh, he, uh, england lost most of his colonies especially lost his uh control over india actually india was the pivotal among the colonies england's colony uh, in india was the pivotal so 1947 uh, india became uh, independent isn't it in india got independence after that uh see there started the very uh, decline of hmm, england in all realms of life in politics as well as in uh, economics hmm? england lost its what dominance so they were mostly hmm, discussing such issues and uh, see in the poems of moment uh, poets you can see day to day uh, day to day issues and languages were colloquial okay i mean words were colloquial because they discuss the problem of the modern man they are not discussing the story of king queens or knights they discuss uh, they are really interest uh, interested in the problem of modern man and they know that there is no solution or end for that see <clears throat> i think you are uh, familiar with john keats hmm? in uh, in his poem he says that truth is beauty and beauty is truth and uh, philip larkin says that see life is not like that you uh, it, uh, life is not always beautiful or one cannot remain uh, truthful to ev uh, everything or everyone always okay so he is again such kind of romantic elements so their poems will be full of sarcasm black humor irony parody pastiche etc so that is why before attempting before uh, learning postmodern poems you should learn postmodern elements you should go through postmodern movement what is postmodernism what are the technical devices or literary devices that poet used to employ or to highlight such elements so you should check what is hyper reality those kind of reality we cannot accept or uh, i yeah another one maximalism minimalism hmm? uh yeah metafiction hmm uh, self reflexive narration unreliable narrator see let me tell you in the modern context we cannot fix anything or we cannot say oh this leads to another or this is the cause for that problem we cannot find any solution or any 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 <clears throat> what root reason for anything everything directs to everything else okay everything is interconnected that is why i said we are living in a chaotic world now let's discuss church going see church going is a very famous poem uh, written by philip larkin written, uh, in 1954 published in 1955 the title is, itself is a pun it's a word play what do you mean by pun p u n pun we have already discussed about pun uh while we uh, discuss the poem caller by george herbert isn't it church going is a pun because it talks about going to church at first context going to church in the second context uh see the very faith is going very faith about church or in religion it is fading two meanings okay i hope you got the relevance of the title church going it is a pun in the first context it means go simply go into church in the second context the very belief or the very faith in church is going is getting faded 
Okay, so <laughs> the poem church going represent the thoughts of the poet as he enters the church. He is, see, he is not a believer. He is a non-believer. Okay, still he believes that okay, religion is good for the human kind. Okay, now, yeah, uh, he enters the church just like he enters the museum. Okay, he enters it not out of that faith, but he just wants to see what's inside the church. Let's see. Okay. To inquire the role of the religion in our daily life. Now, so there are seven stanza and the rhyming scheme A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C, D. Okay. Now, let me tell you, this is a satire. This is a satire. Now, in the end of the po uh, poem, narrator, our poet or the speaker, comes to a conclusion, okay, in the modern context, church has, even though church uh, has lost its relevance or importance, religion has lost its importance, still hmm, there are some people or majority of the people hmm, stick to faith, church, etc. because it is a need. It is a need. It, it, not out of faith or not because of their belief in that, but it is a necessity. It's a need of the time. That is why we are going to church. Okay, so major themes in church going religion. Uh, then established church need to worship ceremony of rituals for a future of church superstition and religious feelings. So, yeah, we have already discussed the title church going. Um, see, this is a serious poem. Also, this is a sarcastic poem. Okay. So, uh, this person, our speaker, or the poet enters the church. Hmm? Uh, see, just to see what is inside the church. Hmm? Uh, just like entering the museum. So, everything in that church looked untouched. And he can sense, he can feel uh, the antiqueness in that church because. See, that church is least used. People are coming on all Sundays to observe the Holy Day, Holy Mass and all. But church still look untouched. Okay. So, let me tell you, is actually mock, uh, mocking that entire belief system. Hmm? Now, uh, see, the benches, hmm? the baptismal font, then <clears throat> altar, dried flowers, etc. Some of the symbols that is used in the poem. Mm? You can see the dried flowers, uh, then dust on the bench, mm? etc. That means, see, people are coming and going. Okay, uh, it is Sunday. We should go to the church, come back. Like that. So after observing, after observing the church, mm? He signs in a ledger book and he gives, he donates six uh, Irish pens and he returns. Okay, then he goes to the churchyard and all. Hmm? So he has seen, see, even though uh, in coming days church will lose its relevance, this more, uh, see, uh, these places will be overgrown with trees and uh, most trees goes, most and al uh, alleys. Okay. But still there, there are some people or uh, there are so many dubious ladies or superstitious ladies. See, some people believe that if you touch and pray on the stone or the tomb of a particular person, you will be healed. <clears throat> you will get a particular power. There are such kind of people. Hmm? So he is, in this poem, he is <clears throat> analyzing, exploring people, different types of people, why they are going to church. Hmm? Uh, what were the very faith of church, the very future of church and uh, church related things. Okay, so he says that in coming days, more and more people will lose their faith in church or the institution of church. Okay, but still there will be some people hmm, who are superstitious. Hmm? Uh, they will go to church because it's a part of their really, not really, uh, yeah, it's a part of their life, not out of belief. But because of the practice. It is their practice. Just like you're going to gym, you're going to museum like that, they will go to church. 
<clears throat> then, uh, yeah. So uh, in this poem, he discusses who could be the last person who has visited this church. Hmm? Maybe someone like him, some antiquarians, some librarians like him. See, uh, see in coming days, uh, people will go to church. Hmm? Yeah, our, our younger generation or the coming generation will go to church, not to pray, but they will be those people who are interested in antiquity, antiqueness, a lover of antiquity. Sometimes one or, one or two, those who are addicted hmm, to church, maybe they will visit. But he says that church will be there. It should be there because some kind of order is necessity because we human beings remain sane. Hmm? Uh, at least we are following some kind of what? Humaneness or we are having some kind of humaneness just because of the just because of that, not the faith. We cannot say that this faith, because we are afraid of those uh, stories hmm? mentioned in Bible hmm? fables. Okay, uh, the evil will be punished, hmm? and the uh, good will be reward uh, rewarded. Such kind of belief, hmm? such kind of belief system uh, that makes the people to go to church. Okay. Now, next poem is I Remember, I Remember. This is also uh, an interesting parody. Let me tell you, Dylan Thomas Wordsworth, they were celebrating childhood days. Okay, childhood days were very beautiful, innocent, uh, so and so, golden days. But this person is entirely opposite. Okay, let's see. Written in 1954, hmm, published in 1955. So he happened, just like in Prelude, hmm, uh, words were traveling in train, he stops by his uh, country, hometown. Hmm? Here, this person accidentally stops uh, by his uh, hometown, uh, Coventry, hmm? where he was born and raised. Hmm? Uh, okay. So somebody asked him, hmm? where he, uh, does he belong to this place? Anyway, he was not that happy when uh, the particular person asked about uh, his <clears throat> hometown because according to Philip Larkin, childhood is such a phase hmm, where nothing will work. See, <laughs> every that is it's this poem is a kind of you know, it's very interesting. It's a kind of you know, it's a comedy. Hmm? If, if you read uh, Dylan, see, try to read this poem after reading Prelude and uh, Fern Hill poems in October. You will laugh. Okay. He says that childhood is such a phase where nothing will work out. Hmm? Nothing will work out. Why? See, uh, just like uh, other poets hmm, who had golden days by the riverside, in the forest, hunting and all, this po poet never has a colorful life. Hmm? Okay, this poet never had a colorful life. While other teenagers were celebrating uh, life, their lives, uh, they, uh, their parents were having Ford car. Okay, let us mention their parents were having uh, luxurious, uh, yeah, very expensive cars and luxurious lifestyle. Hmm? This person was longing for such type of amenities in life. He was longing for that. Okay. Now, when he entered the ad adolescent period, uh, he, he was attracted to, actually he got attracted to a beautiful uh, girl. Mm, he really wanted to, uh, mm, yeah, make love with her. But because of that, uh, what do you call, boyish anxiety or that type of, uh, yeah, anxiety issues, he couldn't, uh, really make it out okay he couldn't really make it out so that is why he blames childhood it's such a phase where nothing where nothing is going to happen okay so why should he, uh, why should he celebrate childhood you understood his childhood was really unhappy so you can compare and contrast the poems of Tylen Thomas and Philip Larkin very interesting Themes in the poem, unspent memories, unspent adolescence. And this person doesn't hold any root to that hometown, unlike the uh, Dylan and Wordsworth. See, 
they are very happy to go to swansea see one is go to go very our dylan thomas belong to swansea and uh, our wordsworth belong to um, downtown okay derwent derwent he is is from the lake city of london so they are very uh, what full spirited to go to their hometown hmm waiting uh, to reach the hometown how to spend they are calculating who how i will spend my days i want to get those days back i want to enjoy i want to go to the woods river just like i uh, i had fun hmm, while i was a boy but this person says oh it's you know even when uh, his friend asks him hmm, uh, do you belong to this place he got irritated why he doesn't hold any beautiful memory <laughs> now as i told he has used very uh, uh, reflective ton personal uh, pronoun then colloquial language uh, no yeah elusive he is let me tell you his uh, he has uh, taken a reclusive type tone not attached but he is detached now next poem is blini Blini is a what do you uh, see? Let me tell you, Blini is an uh, another autobiographical poem. Uh, let uh, it was first published in nineteen fifty five, along with Wins with with Sun Wedding. Okay, so let me tell you, Blini is not uh, none but poet himself. and blini can be any person not only the poet can be any person in the modern era uh, who is meddling with hmm, the ad adulthood problems so themes are loneliness isolation dullness lack of creativity a life full of complications ambition uh, yeah ambitionless life hopelessness so these are the major themes of blini okay so in this poem he is discussing about hmm, a clerk who is not that rich not a rich fellow our poet happened to uh, i mean live in a room who was previously occupied by the person named blini hmm? so blini is a very what unattractive monotone he was leading a, it was an unattractive an attractive man who was uh, having a monotonous life okay but let me tell you uh, he doesn't have many uh, companions so we have discussed okay so i told you blini is poet himself it can be uh, blini can be any man who has lost interest in life who was leading who is leading a monotonous life so the only entertainment that blini had uh, was the radio song that he heard from the house of the house owner and uh, see Uh, see when he entered the room of uh, mr blini that person he said that he was really such a colorless life later he understood that blini uh, mr blini was having a much more colorful life than the poet because actually even though he had only some uh, a few connections in life hmm, he was he was happy hmm, and contented with that a small poem okay So as I said, this is an autobiographical poem. I will mean, Philip Larkin is unmarried. Okay, he is not married. He was also uh, living like Blini in a small room, hmm? in the attic of a, uh, yeah, uh, lady. Then it is a dramatic monologue. So what else? So it also. the very nature of the poem the poem is full of pessimistic elements okay because he was uh, discussing the very character of blini how such a person uh, how one can live uh, such a life like blini hmm, without having much connection with the external world only a few connections like with the landlady two or three friends hmm, then his sister but towards the end author says that Mr. Blini's life was much more colorful than that of the author, our poet. 
or else we can say that blini is none but poet himself because both blini and philip larkin they were both isolated or were leading a reclusive life another poem by philip larkin in this poem uh, see charles actually uh, refers to those people hmm, who are working from morn till evening so in this poem he is uh, see blaming the very stagnation of life see he got very uh, trapped in that library morning till evening he has to sit in that library turning the pages filling the ledger book etc etc so he has sacrificed his life for the work so now he is full of jealousy see uh, when he uh, looks at those people who is uh, celebrating life in the park pub hmm, etc uh, he is full of jealousy how see how those people are enjoying life and here he is sacrificing so this poem is dedicated to those people uh, hmm, those clerks those officers hmm, who are sitting with files so i told you Toad is dedicated to all those uh, people who are working in the office uh, from morn till evening, who are toiling. Okay, that is why it is said to be life is very full of monotonous elements. Nothing new. Working, working and eating, working and sleeping. So yeah, dissatisfaction, freedom and uh, confinement, cunning uh, and cleverness, dream, hopes and plants so these are the major themes in thoughts okay now so a small poem okay toads revisited so let me tell you this is a second poem or companion poem of toad just like milton's poem companion poems we have discussed two milton lalagro and el penisro right we have discussed two poems similarly uh toads and toads revisited are two companion poems in one poem see toad he has written while he was young uh, and toad re toads revisited he wrote this when he became a little bit matured because now he understood the relevance of toad work see only those people will be able to live in the present world who are hard working only those people who are hard working can live in this world actually even though uh, it is tedious miserable but it is it works okay <clears throat> So it is published in nineteen uh, along with yeah nineteen sixty four along with the Whitson wedding. Uh, his attitude to work hmm, has changed. So you can compare and contrast. Both are companion poems, but contradictory themes, contradictory views. Okay. So themes are work life, morality, immorality, and boredom. Hmm? Yeah. So let me tell you. In this poem, going to work is he treated it as morality. It is a it's a part of person's morality that one should go to work. Okay, grown up, you cannot waste your life like that. It is your duty to go to work. It's better to work than uh, what wasting it idle. Okay, so the theme is entirely different. Okay. You can see elements of anger, frustration in this poem because while he is toiling, other people are enjoying life. Uh, towards the end of the poem, we can see that he states that those people are really wasting their life, or else those people who are wasting their life by partying or going to park or uh, disco, they are actually leading an immoral life. Actually, this poem is against his own tradition because Philip Larkin and set of other writers are against any any kind of such kind of systems, rules, and regulations in society. But in this poem, he says that. Yeah, working is a moral part of life. Hmm? That is a morality. Now, at grass, at grass is about yeah was published in nineteen fifty five, along with the collection less deceit. Let me tell you here, hose is used as the metaphor. Hose raising hose is used as the metaphor. So he was inspired by a newsreel film on Brown Jack, the race hose in his retirement. Okay. So, rows here raising horses are compared to uh, ancient or their glorious or great great forefathers, uh, hmm? forefathers in army, military, and navy. Hmm? While they were young, they were leading a very, uh, they were having a very active life. 
they, they controlled the society they had power and yeah they had power status money everything the entire attention were on those see people isn't it uh, those people president then general ex, uh, such kind of uh, people who uh, hold uh, great status in society so while they are young and once they are in power the entire attention hmm, was on those uh, people but once they uh, superannuated hmm, once they are retired once they become old they will lose all those glories those status power attention money they will be unnoticed or unchecked by society okay so their situation is compared with that, that of the raising horse isn't it see those raising horse when they are young and powerful when they have the stamina people will gamble with them isn't it people will bet on them hmm? people will uh, share up uh, will share for those horses hmm? see and their attention will be uh, upon them okay but what happened when they uh, get super innovated no one will be there to attend them they will be left in the meadows they will be great uh, okay so these horses are least bothered even though they, uh, they lost those uh, status hmm, as the race horse they are not uh, bothered uh, see they are happy uh, grazing uh, grass in the meadows so they compare here philip larkin compares race horses with that of the english ancestors those famous generals presidents they are contented with their life they have see they have done what they can hmm, in their lifetime isn't it now they can retire now they can rest so these horses now they are in meadows grazing now they are waiting for the groom boy i mean the one that tend them one uh, who gives them hmm, grasses or yeah one who attend them on other side the groom boy can be death they don't have anyone to wait for see these race horses these race horses who are grazing in meadows they don't have anyone uh, to, to 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 cheer them up hmm? to uh, to bet on uh, them okay except that groom boy who comes and tend them that groom boy can be death that means these race horses are waiting for their death and they are happy they are peaceful they are contented because they have accomplished what they want in their life what they wanted in their life <clears throat> so let me tell you this is a heavy dose of pessimism okay the poem is full of pessimistic uh, stuff uh, actually all poems of philip larkin is full of pessimism dark bleak bleak tone actually this is the pathetic side of human life now old age themes in, uh, in at grass old age loneliness memory loss of british empire yeah so it not only talks about the english ancestor it also talks about the british empire isn't it after 1960 1950 british empire has lost its glory once it uh, had so many colonies like uh, yeah, yeah india africa australia and ireland people held them i mean held those english ancestors of british empire with respect and oh but once they lost the authority or colonies now they have or it has the same fate of race horse okay um uh, another poem it's witsen wedding so witsen wedding is also hmm, a sarcastic poem in which he satirizes rituals beliefs um, or certain practices in society especially marriage philip lacken is remember philip lacken is unmarried okay so let me tell you witsen day hmm, the day Uh, on which uh, on this particular day british government frees marriage tax for one day on this particular day british government uh, frees taxes okay 
so on this day so many people hmm, get ma- uh, they, uh, they they choose uh, they choose this day to get married because they can save money isn't it so uh, this attitude has been satirized in the poem with sen wedding so with sen wedding is the seventh sunday after easter okay this is the seventh sunday with sunday or with sen day <clears throat> so in this poem he is describing the journey with brides and grooms after wedding see let me tell you uh, he is a librarian right so after his work daily he travels in a he used to travel in a train so most of the poems are written in his uh, journey in the train okay so here he he happened to see uh, so many brides and grooms boarding the train and other people i have come uh, there to see of them and they are giving them set of advices some are happy some are crying etc etc so philip larkin is very curious to see uh, such kind of things in society and he is he is also uh, see ridiculing them because cho- for choosing such a day as day for the marriage see there is no point in uh, calling uh, one and uh, see each and every one for the marriage because see we call our dear and near ones uh, apart from that our neighbors hmm, also uh, in the distant circle to the marriage isn't it so philip larkin is asking see perhaps we won't see some of them hmm, after uh, that in our life after marriage hmm, see marriage a birth, a birthday party such kind of things as a kind of reunion isn't it kind of reunion uh, but after that ceremony maybe some of us will never meet in life so why they are uh, holding such kind of things there is no point because we are not going to keep up relation forever even this bride and uh, grooms they will not be uh, together uh, forever in their life maybe that will end up in a divorce or some, something like that so he is very curious about such kind of practices hmm, in society so this is a satirical poem okay so major themes class country uh, yeah he talks see mostly he talks about the lower class people here he is satirizing the lower uh, practices of lower class people it is those people who are very much Uh, i mean mediocres middle class people and uh, lower class people who are bothered about the witch and day because they are they are the one who cho- uh, choose this day for their wedding okay so he says that marriage is a kind of uh, what uh, a farcial hmm? yeah a burlesque a comical drama he sees it as a comedy okay see bride and attendees see let me tell you he watches that marriage procession or bride and grooms just like he is watching a shakespearean romantic comedy because uh, there is no point now yeah another point is uh, country and city life so these see these bride and bride groom got into the train from the countryside now they will reach the city and the life will be entirely different they will be fascinated by the con- see those brides hmm, uh, who got married to the city of course uh, in a, in a year or two they will get fascinated by the city life of course they will uh, lose touch with their parents or with their partners okay now the next one is the context of he next context is marriage and love so he is have he takes a cynical attitude towards marriage hmm? because already i have discussed that he sees wedding as a farcial ceremony artificial costume hmm? embarrassing family members see what is the very point of crying at the time uh, at the time of uh, seeing of some uh, person pointless totally pointless next time they uh, next the very next moment they'll be happy they'll be celebrating they will be having tea or something like that so these things are just show off <clears throat> now other religious thing like a uh, religious wound he, he even uh, ridicules the sarcastic uh, religious wound which is the bleeding of vir- um, virgin bride 
Hmm? See, Victorian England, hmm? uh, unlike Victorian England uphold that morality at the highest level and that, uh, that still continued uh, in the 20, first, first half of the 20th century. Now, unlike American writers or American society, uh, British society or English society upholds their moral moral side. Okay. Now, isolation. See, this person, we have already discussed many of his poems like Blini, Todd, Todd Revisited, I Remember, etc. He is a recluse. He's a recluse. He's totally alienated, isolated from the other people. Hmm? But, yeah. <clears throat> that is why he sees everything uh, from the eyes of a stranger. He says that it's a precarious community, very dangerous community. Hmm? Those uh, people who participated uh, 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 in the wedding ceremony, he calls them precarious or a dangerous community. Now, yeah, I will sum up this in 10 or 5 minutes, okay? Okay, next poet is Sylvia Plath. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's a confessional poet, uh, wife of Ted Dukes. I think you are familiar with Ted Dukes, animal poet, very famous uh, animal poet. She married to Ted Dukes, uh, this uh, Sylvia Plath. She committed suicide by placing her head in the oven. Try, she tried to commit suicide, but her third attempt became very successful. And this first, uh, she suffered from Electra complex. Ele uh, she had a kind of father fixation. Father fixation, Electra complex. In all these poems, in all her poems, we can see the influence of her father. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, her, her father was a German and uh, he was a professor at you uh, uh, in a college in USA hmm? and uh, her mother was uh, the student of her father okay now let me tell you daddy colossus ariel etc uh, yeah lady rezaris etc some of the uh, famous poems of sylvia plath now she was very she was a, a brilliant student she got scholarship that's how she uh, came to england and she joined cambridge university where she met Ted Dukes and fell in love with him and got married. Uh, see, while she was doing her graduation, she tried to commit suicide, but that was unsuccessful. Uh, let me, uh, after, see, after marrying uh, Ted Dukes, she begot two children uh, yeah, from him. Uh, what, okay, in 1963, she committed suicide. See, after having th uh, two kids, Ted Dukes left Sylvia Plath for another poet and uh, six months later, she committed suicide. So let me tell you, she's uh, she suffered uh, from depression hmm, and father fixation. And Belja is her last Swan's work, or Swan's uh, that's her Swan song, last work, Belja. Okay, so common theme in Plath's poetry, common. Theme in Sylvia Plath's poetry. Hmm? Feminist. Okay, so feminist protest, humanitarian protest against Nazi atrocity. Let me tell you, when you read the poem, sometimes you will have uh, you you may have some kind of doubt that her father, whether her, her father is a Nazi. No, her father is not a Nazi. Well, let me tell you, he's only uh, from Germany, but this girl being a bit weird, she presented her father has a Nazi supporter. Okay, just because uh, he holds um, German citizenship, she says that her father is a Nazi supporter and she is also partially uh, German. Okay, then identity crisis, of course, uh, almost all those people who had migrated to some other country mm, will have identity crisis, multiculturalism, isn't it? Uh, we know that America mm, originally belongs to Red Indians. It is the white, uh, those white people are settlers. So multiculturalism. Mm, uh, but that's one of the features of American society. So almost all people, mm, all uh, gen uh, modern generation, people in the modern generation, they have identity crisis. 
due to their hybrid nature then psychological trauma nervous breakdown childhood memories death and suicide oppress oppression and empowerment etc some of the major themes common themes in her poetry okay and she has used lot of roman greek mythologies in the poem where she has equated herself and her father to roman deities roman and greek deities see block 10 even though poems have got lot of uh, stuff uh, see if you go through if you learn the common themes of these poets it's easy to cover all these poems yeah you have more than 10 poems i think yeah some what 17 or 16 poems are there in the block but go through the themes first first of all you master the characteristics of the poetry common themes nature of the poet then go to the poem it will be easy for you what is confessional poetry so confessional poet poets are those poet who discuss uh their pers and who discuss the personal issues in life say like there are certain uh topic that we don't discuss uh openly okay during those days uh we don't nowadays we are discussing things openly like death trauma and depression and all but uh, back in 90 uh, 1960 1940s uh, that was a new trend to discuss personal issues personal i mean in uh, most uh, intimate issues like death trauma depression infidelity in life marriage life etc so it's a genre of poetry identified hmm, in the decades immediately after second world war yeah after uh second world war 1960 1950 etc it was initiated by the publication of robert lowell's life studies so this trend came into being after the publication of life of life studies by robert lowell and the most noted uh, poet in uh, Con, uh, in conventional uh, realm are uh, <coughs> Sylvia Plath, Theodore Roosevelt, and Annie Sexton. So let's see what is uh, confession. We have seen what is confessional poetry. So poet mostly these poet took first person. They uh, uh, yeah they followed first person narrative uh, in the poem using first person pronoun like I, me, my. Hmm? Okay, they. explore intimate topics hmm? as i uh, as we discussed love affairs suicide fear <clears throat> of failure violent trauma uh, yeah violent thoughts towards family members hmm? trauma etc now one second <clears throat> traits of plath confessional poetry let's see what's what's typical about silvia plath of course as we discussed first person narration i me my okay she yeah mostly she described the stuff from first person point of view autobiographical okay almost all her poems are autobiographical in nature and the center figure figure in her poems uh, was her hmm? mm, dad hmm? her father sometimes her husband now colossus see the poem was published in 1960 hmm in this poem uh, see we know that colossus is one of the ancient world wonders isn't it you might have seen that picture hmm, on internet or in the books isn't it uh, the giant figure of colossus hmm, standing in the city of rhodes showing light to uh, ships from uh, mediterranean sea isn't it that's a famous uh, yeah sculpt so in this poem she is mourning Hmm? the death of her father let me tell you see if you have gone through the mg 101 uh, question paper you might have seen that she is calling uh, she is against her dad hmm? she is using bad way, bad words at her dad not let uh, she is not actually against her dad she is sad because her dad hasn't taught her how to live without him see silvia plath lost her dad when she was young while she was 10 years uh, yeah while she was 10 years old she lost her dad hmm? and in all her poems she is actually uh, scolding her dad oh you are so cruel you are so brutal 
Hmm. Daddy, you bastard. She has called so many jargon, uh, um, what do you call it? So many terms like that. Reason is, she is not actually against her dad. But I repeat, her dad hasn't taught her how to live in the modern society without him. Actually, let me tell you, uh, it is from our mom that we receive that intellectual elements, isn't it? The intellectual side of, yeah, is received from mother. A child receives intellectual side from mother. And the courage and how to face the society, the courage and endurance. That part is received from father, isn't it? Yeah. So Sylvia Plath hasn't got such kind of support from her father. Has she, has she had uh, died in a uh, baby? Uh, at her, uh, uh, while she was 10 years old, isn't it? That is the reason why she is angry. She says that she is suffering just because she, right now she is suffering. She is having all kind of problems in the society. She doesn't know how to mingle with people. She doesn't know how to face problems. That reason is her father hasn't taught her. Got it. So, yeah. So see, she is uh, discussing all these kind of bizarre, exaggerated, nightmarish elements in the poem. And Colossus, he, uh, that is a giant uh, figure from Greek mythology, right? So she equates her dad with that of Colossus. Let me tell you, in ancient world, that was a world wonder. Mm -hmm. In ancient society, that was a world wonder. It had a great prominence in the ancient world. But now Colossus doesn't exist isn't it colossus doesn't exist uh it has broken his uh, it has uh fallen down isn't it <clears throat> similarly her dad also lost relevance okay so the main theme of this poem is parental influence personal struggles hmm? yeah you see this i shall never get you uh put together see how uh, uh so Colossus statue has been uh, shattered into pieces, just like her dad. Hmm? Her dad had died, and now she is trying to uh, hmm, put it together, but she can't. It is impossible. Hmm? It's proceeding from see mule, brain, pig, grunt, body, cackles proceed from your great lips. So she is uh, saying that her dad had called her so many names. It's not see most of the things that she discusses in the poem. Uh, see that is not real. Okay, that is not real. That is all hallucination. Uh, as she had, she is not a normal poet. Okay, she is. Uh, she suffered from depression, bipolar disorder, and all. Hmm? So whatever stuff she is uh, discussing in the poem that is created, all those things as a result of her mental depression. Now, perhaps you consider yourself uh, an oracle, mouthpiece of death. Of some god or other. Thirty years now, I have labored to gretch the silt from your throat. I am none the wiser. See, that she compares her dad with that of hmm, yourself and oracle. Some uh, whom uh, see only those prominent people or other powerful people are uh, able to uh, give uh, oracle right. So uh, she says that her dad was. She believed that her dad was a god, but he died. Hmm? You know, I am laboring. I have been laboring for 30 years. That means she is now 30 years. She has been uh, leading a life without him for 20 years. See, I am none the wiser without you. I don't know how to live in this society. But you won't get that stand. When you read, she is blaming her dad. Oh, he's such a cruel person. He had tortured her a lot. When you read the poem, we will get such a, uh, what? Such kind of indications. But things are not like that. Actually, she loves her father, but she is very much uh, frustrated because he lost, sorry, she lost him. <clears throat> now, so in this poem, she's trying to fix the statue of Colossus. She's passing through the uh, passing through the bros and uh, entering the ears of the great statue, hmm, trying to fix it. Now, she understood that the great statue has lost the importance in the present world because it belongs to the ancient world wonders, just like that, just like her father, 
belong to the um, i mean old society now a father is no more okay now yeah. so the themes gender and oppression power and myth making death and memory yeah so these are the major themes power and myth making means uh, yeah so daddy the next poem okay daddy the uh, center figure is her dad hmm? so here also she continues the same theme daddy hmm? she calls uh, bad names at her dad uh, here also she presents hmm, herself as a girl with electra complex but when she published it when she has given an interview for bbc radio she says that, uh, she presented it in the form of a third person narrator okay uh, so in this poem he presented her dad as a nazi supporter hmm? uh, someone who uh, oppressed her okay so another theme is power and myth making i told you he compares her dad with that of dai uh, dai is similar theme similar theme that, that with that of colossus okay uh, yeah and she presented as herself as electra okay electra and uh, her dad as admiral and her mom as uh, clytemnestra so in this poem she is trying to reunite with her dad i told you thrice she committed to suicide you know why she has committed to suicide because she wanted to uh, reunite with her father she tried to she married ted dukes let me tell you she married ted dukes and she tried to see her father's figure in ted dukes but she failed he left her for other women and <laughs> she says that ted dukes sucked her blood for 7 years and he was a black man hmm? so he failed she failed in her attempt to find her fatherly figure in her husband and then she tried to commit suicide so has to join her dad hmm that also failed so all her attempts to bring back her father hmm, was brutally failed so so uh, that is why in this poem she compares herself to a foot inside a black shoe hmm? for 30 years she lived in this way she compares herself to a foot inside a black shoe hmm? uh, she cannot breathe sneeze she cannot do anything because her father hasn't taught her okay now yeah so every time when she invokes her father hmm, she she got a reply in G uh, german oh you just like in english movies uh, in mummy returns and all people are trying to invoke and bring back the uh, i mean those deities back to life similarly uh, here silvia plath also tried to bring back her father and she uh, puts herself uh, in a, such a setting in borderland a destroyed city uh, yeah distracted city in the second world war and she's uh, calling her father hmm she says that she was trapped she was trapped in this present world and she compares herself to jew she compares her father to father to a nazi and her to a jew okay now she is uh, in, in see this is an imaginary poem written in hallucination okay she is traveling to uh, hmm? she is traveling in a train to austria hmm? the uh, austria is here described or presented as a impure or a false city then yeah to, uh, in the beginning of the poem she says that uh, why do you know why she compares her father to a deity or a god hmm? something like that because he belongs to uh germany mm, we know that aryan race blue eyes etc etc so that is the reason why uh, she presented uh, him as a god but later she understood that her father was not a god but just a simple swastika one who supported uh, the one who supported hitler mm? actually let me tell you actually his her father hasn't supported hitler all these are her um, what imagination now okay so that's all about the poem um, now next poem is lady lazarus in lady lazarus here also the uh, 
another poem by our Sylvia Plath, where she uses biblical uh, allusions. Okay, biblical allusions. Where she, what, why does Lady Lazarus? Lay, we know that Lazarus is a biblical character, isn't it? Who was resurrected by Jesus Christ. But she has used here Lady Lazarus. Hmm? Speaker is also resurrected. But uh, the theme is entirely uh, different. Resurrection is a happy theme. It's a positive theme, isn't it? But in this poem, resurrection is not treated as a happy, uh, in a happy tone. She is she really wanted to die because she just want to uh, escape from the male dominated oppressive society. She has been suffering for long thirty years, hmm, where she doesn't have the courage to face the problems. Hmm. She was shunned by the male dominated society, so that is why she tried to commit suicide. But every single time when she uh, uh, tried to commit suicide, she was saved by the dear ones or the doctors. So actually, she she calls them her enemies because they have hmm, sabotaged all her attempts to get uh, to escape from this oppressive world. So the theme of the poem is empowerment and hopelessness, hmm? and the metaphor death and resurrection. I told you resurrection is not a positive; it's not treated in a positive way in this. Uh, poem hmm? uh, as in other poems. Okay. So, motive hmm, taken from Bible. Uh, yeah, back to life concept, resurrection. Lady Lazarus, she presented herself as a phoenix. Hmm? Liberation. See, once uh, once she dies, only she can become, become uh, a phoenix. Okay. But let me tell you, she says she presented entire society or entire community who tried to save her as spectator. See, as sad or masochistic. You know, I think you people are familiar with uh, Strip Tease Act. In, uh, yeah, Strip Tease Act is a popular act mm, in England, uh, you know, England and America and almost all those kind of pop, uh, uh, all those of country who are having pop culture, hmm? popular culture. Strip Tease Act. Just, uh, just Google for strip. Those who don't know, please uh, Google for Strip Tease Act. Okay, <laughs> fine. So she says that she is holding a Strip Tease Act for the entire society. She is, she is performing for the society because death is a death is an art. Death is a beautiful art. Every single time she tries uh, that art, she is getting saved by the spectators who are spectators the crowd that scrub uh okay the crowd that scrutinized her hmm? they are the spectators they are uh, they are the people who uh, save her so let me tell you crowd or the society or audience her audience are sad are sad or masochistic because they are taking pleasure in the suffering of other i mean whom do we call a sad or masochist I mean, those people who take pleasure uh, in the suffering of others, they are said to be sad or masochistic. Okay. See, she wanted to die, but others are saving her. So let me tell you. Uh, yeah. Again, she is presented as uh, the Jewish theme. Hmm? It's, uh, it's again um, brought here because... When you die, you will be wrapped in linen, just like mummies, Egyptian mummies, isn't it? Uh, so every time um, she come, uh, she tries to commit suicide. That this time, okay, I will die. Hmm? But uh, she will be saved. She will be unwrapped. She will. That is why the strip tease act is mentioned. What is? Uh, what will you do on uh, while the strip tease act? The performer will, will remove that dress one by one, isn't it? The performer on the stage will remove the dress one by one. Similarly, when she commits suicide, she thinks that she will be wrapped as mummy, but she will be saved. So she will be unwrapped. She will be uh, bring back to life. Uh, again. Isn't it? She will be brought back to life again. So she says that these people are actually 
uh, what torturing her and their society is torturing her society doesn't like hmm, she uh, uh, i mean uh, sylvia plath getting escape from her problems actually she sees uh, suicide as a kind of escape hmm? but society is not allowing her because society really want to enjoy the suffering uh, enjoy uh, how she, the way she suffers so they are receiving some kind society is receiving some, some kind of sexual gratification isn't it when other people suffer certain people will get some kind of sexual gratification so actually a society is getting some kind of sexual gratification so these are the major themes death and suicide uh, gender and oppression etc etc <clears throat> so i'm not reading this poem okay we have discussed the uh, lady lazarus theme now moving to parda okay parda is an oriental concept isn't it something doesn't belong to western society parda is a concept of southeast uh, asian society or a west eastern culture isn't it an exotic culture uh, or an oriental theme so published in 1971 hmm, uh, parda is about a woman uh, behind uh, parda hmm, which is a veil hmm. so all those women so generally we have a concept that the the one behind the parda will be immensely or very beautiful but uh, inside the poem she is presenting such a woman who is murderous vengeful seeking revenge okay unlike the normal tradition the woman behind this parda is very vengeful of course she is beautiful at the same time very mysterious and vengeful okay so parda means a curtain or a screen actually par the woman in parda is none but sylvia plath herself okay society sees uh, society sees her as a beautiful woman but behind that screen behind that curtain she is a wrathful woman hmm? she want to die she want to react against the oppression male dominated society of so and so okay uh, that is the main theme of parda so in parda she presents such a uh, jade hmm? cladded uh, yeah a woman uh, in uh, wearing jade hmm? uh, uh, sitting cross legged hmm? uh, uh, yeah sitting and smiling uh, yeah um, then what um, her qualities have been equated with that of moon very sophisticated very refined hmm? i told i repeat in parada uh, uh, here fill it um, what do you call for that yeah sylvia plath presents a woman wearing jade and yeah jade necklace and also uh, having a veil hmm? she is smiling sitting cross legged then her qualities have been uh, compared with that of moon we know that uh, among other planets moon has been uh, given uh, had attributed with the romantic qualities most polished qualities so the one in parda obviously very beautiful hmm? uh, and having many feminine qualities epitome of all qualities but towards the end of the poem we can see that she is not that refined not that beautiful actually she turns into a beast that is the concept of parda the one in parda one in curtain one behind the screen now ariel the last poem so ariel is the last swan song of our sylvia plath after publishing this she committed hmm, uh, suicide hmm, after pu 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 publishing the collection of poems uh, titled ariel she committed suicide now see here she uses hmm, ariel with multiple connotations so those people who are familiar with tempest shakespeare's romantic comedy tempest at least those people who had uh, read tempest they know uh, the name ariel isn't it ariel is a spirit in tempest hmm? uh, it doesn't have any gender it is not uh, yeah neither male or nor female isn't it now ariel is also the name of sylvia plath uh, see she had a host so her host name is ariel so ariel is a sexless concept Hmm? Ariel is also hmm? 
also denote to us uh, denote to the city of jerusalem it is both an impure city and also a sanctified city a cursed at the same time sanctified city chosen by the god a land chosen by the god so let me tell you there are multiple connotations for ariel the first connotation the first indication is ariel is a sexless figure in shakespeare shakespeare's tempest it is through the medium of ariel prospero shakespeare's superman has accomplished all his missions isn't it you uh, the one uh, i mean those people who have read uh, tempest uh, you will be knowing that it is through ariel that they have accomplished everything now second concept is uh, uh, it is the name of her horse silvia plats horse name is ariel now the word ariel also denotes to the city of jerusalem hmm? the city which has been uh, regarded as the uh, hmm? city of cursed as well as sanctified now here also she presents the same theme freedom and escape freedom and escape okay uh, so anyway here hose uh, here hose is presented hmm, as a rebellious spirit hmm? uh, sometime you will be switched hmm, with the concept of hose becomes uh, because she has in the change the speaker and the hose hmm? okay Uh, so here, uh, female speaker that is Ariel uh, or the what do you call Sylvia Plath. She wanted to get the rebellious spirit from the hose. Hmm? She wanted to have the uh, spirit of the hose, and she wanted to escape from society. Hmm? And she also presents. Uh, she calls her hose as God Lioness. She has used. Uh, she uh, you must note that is a gender gen genderized term. instead of call, uh, instead of presenting a horse as a lion she calls it has god lioness she has given a female image uh, or a female uh, yeah image to that horse hmm? now yes so the right uh, she is riding that horse okay so that can be seen as a transformation from childhood phase to Uh, ad, uh, adolescent or to the adulthood phase hmm? or orgasmic awakening of adolescence the riding on the horse hmm? the ride on the uh, horse and that can be also seen as a moment uh, a journey from darkness to light let me tell you ariel which is a horse in this poem hmm, uh, actually it stands as a rebellious spirit sometime the female speaker hmm herself okay then a journey from darkness to hmm, light then a transformation from childhood ignorance to orgasmic adolescent awakening hmm or the entire poem talks about feminist awakening so let me tell you uh, in this poem silvia plath is riding that horse hmm, uh, her favorite horse its name is ariel hmm so <clears throat> she calls she wanted she really want to get some part of energy from the horse which she presents as god lioness yes it's a genderized term because she has given female qualities to that horse lioness that is why she repeatedly calls lioness lioness and all hmm then one more uh, thing uh, i would like to say that see here she brings the story of lady godiva hmm? uh, lady godiva is a hmm, see sax uh, saxon noble woman of 11th century she has revolted against her husband hmm? uh, yeah she has revolted her, her against her husband because her husband was very tyrant and he had uh, taxed the people hmm, of england so in order to relieve the common people poor people from the clutches of her husband uh, hmm, uh, she dared to ride the horse naked her husband told uh, god i mean lady godiva that he will exempt he will exempt the people from the heavy taxation or the harsh tax taxation if she is ready to ride the horse naked anyway uh, she has taken up the challenge and she rode the horse naked 
let me tell you none of the people in that town came out when she wrote naked so let me tell you lord godiva is the first uh, lady hmm? that too from 11th century from a highly moralistic uh, society like england she came out of that fetter chain hmm? she uh, she has broken that chain isn't it for the goodness of the society she has broken the chain and freed the entire people from the cruelty of her husband lady godiva just like that our silvia plath is riding hmm, is riding from darkness to light or from the confinement to freedom or she is escaping from the uh, brutal society okay so this poem can be seen as a, a poem of feminist awakening or enlightenment path towards feminist enlightenment or awakening or like self discovery hmm? anything so identity uh, she self identification so far she was uh, she felt she was powerless now she understood she equates herself with that of god see in the last couple of poems we have learned that uh, she is very much frustrated very angry at her dad because she lost her power she doesn't know how to leave and she scolds her dad for that but in this poem we can see that she presented her host as well as herself as a god hmm? and she compares it to god lioness i hope you have understood with that we have completed british poetry and blocks have been completed okay we have discussed mm -hmm. all poems Okay then bye